Resident Evil 8 is my favorite game of 2021. That doesn't mean a whole lot, as I haven't played a lot of 2021 games, and probably won't get to nearly all of them for at least a few years. No, I have not played Deathloop as of this writing, and really there's only one contender in mind that could really make a push for the title, but we'll see. So let me clarify the situation somewhat by pointing out that RE Village is quickly climbing the ranks of my favorite Resident Evil games overall, and that's not something that I say lightly. The Resident Evil series has been with me for a long time. Playing the remake of the first game for the first time on the GameCube nearly two decades ago, yes, two decades, oh gosh, what happened? was not only an introduction to what is essentially my favorite video game franchise, but it was also my first real foray into all things scary. I really didn't do horror movies or scary games until the one day that I rented Resident Evil Remake from my local video store on Impulse. Amazingly, this very actual copy, which I bought from the video store when they video stored their way over the horizon into the ether, this is where one of the price stickers used to be, this game is where my interest in horror films and scary games started. It's been snowballing from there ever since. So to call this game formative for me in the development of my appreciation of things would be, to put it lightly, accurate as hell. The series has been a constant for me ever since. Catching up on the games that had come beforehand and then what came afterwards was never really a question. It was just the thing to do. I've been there for the highs and the lows, and to put this into my personal context, Resident Evil is a franchise that contains what I consider to be two of the best video games ever made, and two of the worst. But let it never be said that comebacks don't happen. Resident Evil 7 Biohazard was such a thorough and proper turnaround from the installments that came before, it was almost difficult to see it as part of the same series. In truth, you could make the argument that Resident Evil 7 should have had a new name and just been allowed to be its own thing. It shifted the series into first person. There is a stronger emphasis on an obvious, up-close and personal kind of horror, and the story, carrying a distinctly different tone than usual, could function perfectly on its own. Personally, I'm kind of glad the series has continued the way it has, but I'll explain more on that later. Resident Evil 8, or Resident Evil Village, I think either are appropriate, and I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably from now on for the sake of variety, is, as of the time of this writing, the latest entry into the series, and has cemented itself as a new high point in this game franchise that I love, continuing the new legacy started with 7. It's not perfect, there are plenty of things about the game I might change, refine, or omit entirely, but as part of the wider saga, considered as a whole, I think it might be my favorite piece of it all, but on more of a conceptual level. There are games that I think are better experiences, more fun to play, and more fun to argue about with other fans and defend to my dying breath as good games. Seriously, just give it a shot. But Resident Evil Village is a game that crystallized why I love the Resident Evil franchise as much as I do. A prism that changed the light around the series in such a way that made it brighter to me. It's a game that borrows from just about every other game in the series, and uses all of those tools to drive an experience that stands far and away from the ones that came before it, building on what Seven started, and taking it in a direction I'm so excited to follow that hopefully they follow through on. It's a weird thought, because it's not a story that's that different or even really distinct from what we've all seen before. A father fights tooth and nail to rescue his daughter from the monsters who have kidnapped her, and he navigates unimaginable trials and hardships and hand damage in order to do so. Ethan Winters is tormented by his enemies, as he just tries to do what any good father would, save his daughter from the dangers of the world around her. We've seen this kind of story before, to the extent that you could call it tired or played out. I'm not sure we needed Taken with werewolves either, but this setting and concept actually does a great job of placing Resident Evil Village apart from the series that came before it, and it provided me with an opportunity to mull over some of my larger thoughts about the series overall which is what this video is about. Village is kind of a landmark for the franchise because for the first time in its history, Resident Evil is almost interested in its protagonist. 
and it most certainly has not been in the past. Resident Evil protagonists are well known in the gaming canon. Leon S. Kennedy, Chris Sinclair Redfield, and Jill Valentine are names just about anyone in video game centric circles will have heard, and they are well loved characters. The series therein, however, has always carried itself with a certain level of disconnection. Even from the very beginning of the first game, the lead characters are barely even given the time of day. A series of bizarre murders have occurred on the outskirts of Raccoon City, and STARS, Special Tactics and Rescue Service, has been dispatched to try and get to the bottom of it. After that, as far as any kind of backstory goes, we learn about as much as Jill knows how to pick locks and play the piano, and Chris has a lighter and doesn't know how to play the piano. Chris and Jill are essentially player insert characters, but with voice actors, and the supporting characters around them are kind of just there for the ride. Barry's really the only character in the game who gets something outside the current situation to work with, and even then, that's not what the game is interested in. Mentioning it only in throwaway lines late in the game, not even letting him explain the situation himself. The focus of the game is found in the environments, and putting together the events that led up to what we are experiencing now. The mysteries of the mansion, the letters and journals of the long gone people involved, are what this game is. It doesn't dwell on sentimentality, and only offers any kind of catharsis to its characters after they've crossed the finish line. Moments like Itchy Tasty, Lisa Trevor's Cabin, or Residence Room 1 are where this game earns its reputation for near-perfect atmosphere and as one of the premier survival horror games in the genre's history. I even did a video breaking down one of these moments specifically because of how well constructed it is. It's all there, and it doesn't need its characters present for it to work. Anyone could be the main character of this game. It's not based on introspection. There aren't illusions about what might or might not be metaphorical. It is pure and unadulterated unknowing, facing down the altering of nature, the loss of humanity, all in service of what turns out to be nothing more than the desires of a madman, trying to create a new way to kill people, believing it to be beautiful. Resident Evil Remake is one of my all-time favorite games, both as a gameplay experience and a thematic concept. It's a game I could definitely talk about at length and fully plan to, hopefully soon, but a big part of what I love is how it is the beginning of an exploration in scale and scope. The mansion incident, depicted at the beginning of the series, was a situation spiraling slowly out of control, and thank goodness we managed to handle it because ooh, it might have gotten ugly if things had gotten worse. But what if we didn't handle it? Cue the rest of the series. Zombies crowding the streets, souped up mega mutants hunting down witnesses of the corruption at hand, even Umbrella's own facilities are falling apart amidst this collapse. What starts as small incidents spiral into big problems. We go from slow, spooky mysteries to true survival horror, as we are literally dodging the undead in what used to be a city, just trying to find shelter from the madness. Resident Evil 2 is where this series really plants its flag, offering the first glimpses of just where this nightmare is headed how far this conspiracy reaches, and what's more, what this series has the potential to say. Secret assassinations, all the way up to hidden prisons, laboratories, and black sites on remote islands. It all paints a picture of a terrible situation spiraling progressively more and more out of control. What began as a close quarters exercise in proper plain sight horror reaches its zenith as cities are zombified, conspiracies start to unravel, and twisted experiments are revealed one after another until we see just how out of hand everything gets. If Resident Evil was a warning of horrors yet to come, Resident Evils 2, 3, and Code Veronica are those horrors, taking the fear out of the room with us and sending it out into the world, spreading into the furthest reaches of our understanding. From our individual perspective, it's not unreasonable to think of something like a city as a great monolith, a fortress that will outlive us all, stand the test of time and weather the ages. And here it is burning like so much kindling on the fire. 
so many. But in all of this, the characters in Resident Evil remain in their tacit states. What happened before this apocalypse in motion, either backstory or personal conflicts, isn't important to the series. These characters simply show up on the scene and adapt to what is put in front of them. As far as the games are concerned, they might as well have sprung into existence the moment we turned the console on. Most of them are law enforcement, or working for agencies directly involved in this continuing crisis as the series goes on. The ones that aren't are bystanders, caught up in something undeniable that you couldn't look away from even if you tried. In fact, there is, I think, only one true example of the series stepping outside of itself, trying to offer some context and backstory, and it just so happens to be one of my big sticking points in the series at large. Resident Evil Zero tried, oh how it tried, to give Billy Cohen a redemption moment by having an actual in-game flashback with a tearful revelation that Billy is actually innocent, he's really a hero, and he never should have been put in prison in the first place. <coughs> <clears throat> uh, anyways, it wants to be this big, important moment, but it serves no real purpose other than, I guess, to put to rest any moral concerns the player might have about playing as a convict. I've already worn handcuffs. It doesn't really do much else, and really sticks out amongst the tone of the rest of the series. Resident Evil 6 also has a moment like this that we even get to play through, when Chris stops mid-mission to remember another mission that is kinda just more of the same. Whatever, it, it's not a good bit. These are strange departures for a series that has been grounded in the here and now the rest of the time. Because if there's one thing this series has been driving home up to this point, it's that the apocalypse doesn't play favorites, and the point isn't to reflect on how this affects normal life. There is no more normal. It's just here and now. The notes, hints, and clues we used to piece everything together in the first game remain a constant throughout the series, and for the most part are the only way the Resident Evil games are at all concerned with dwelling in the past. A crisis in motion swirling all around you doesn't really lend itself to random asides to hang out in the past that don't move anything forward. Instead, the games want us to learn what led to this, and who guided our reality into devastation. What makes Resident Evil stand out amongst other zombie-centered media to me is how revealing the deeper details of the game is to find out that this wasn't inevitable, or simply some natural happenstance that we just unfortunately are on the other end of. We find that the architects of this madness vastly overestimated their abilities to control what they set in motion. It was just a few mistakes and a lack of forethought. In the end, our main characters should consider themselves lucky to even be in a position that allows the details of where it all went wrong to be seen. They should feel honored to be so close to the people the Resident Evil games really care about. The villains. From secret smooth criminal plot twists and persecuted mad scientists just out for revenge, to the cartoonish supervillain who can do this, and the old money assholes who just need something to do on a Wednesday evening, this series is almost obsessed with conveying to us the thoughts, feelings, and goals of those who brought about this end to society as we know it, over and above the characters we are playing as. Between the notes and clues we get depicting their progress to the positions they end up in, their motivations and desires, and yes, the cutscenes offering these details, the situation is undeniably built around these people. And sure, zombies are scary, but we've had four games of them so far, and every time they need to be one-upped by just how weird the situation gets when they're not addressed and dealt with. The pervasive ground-level terror of Resident Evil is always underlined by the effects of scope, the disparity between those in power and those who can't help but witness the impending fallout. And so, the story that Resident Evil really wants to tell us has almost always happened before the player enters the situation. With the exception of Claire, who is specifically looking for her brother Chris throughout the series, which also ends up being a bit of backstory quickly sidelined in favor of the bigger happenings, what is going on in the games themselves is the culmination of circumstances. The consequences of decisions made are what is on display. It's just that at the point the game begins, the only thing left to show is normal people facing down the storm unleashed on the world by these driven and motivated bad people. We're just in the line of fire. They wield power, 
It is chaotic and strange, often uncontrollable, and the story Resident Evil is telling, for all intents and purposes, is about these people and the power they have. How they use it, but most importantly, how they got it. In my mind, Resident Evil, more than a classic horror series, presents an interesting science fiction concept. The alternate reality of the Resident Evil world is one beset by great powers of a strange and unknown animalistic nature all around us, lying in wait. The progenitor virus, the Plagos parasite, the mold and the megamycete, all hiding in the depths of wilderness or fossilized deep in the crust of the planet, not plotting or scheming as we would understand it, simply waiting for the right circumstances to flourish. These things are not evil, they are just there, like natural disasters, waiting patiently to destroy the world we know and love. Then a bunch of venture capitalists come along, try their hardest to pull this terrifying thing into the human realm, and figure it's time to make a super weapon. What we see in the series is a result of that hubris. Infighting, corporate decay, or simply malicious intent is enough to tip that first domino, sending everything spiraling. The seeds of mistakes planted decades ago flowering into all-out disasters. The bad guys rarely ever manage to successfully harness these powers and just end up leaving them to slowly poison the world around them. Sadler being in control of a massive hive mind army, the development of the tyrant, and whatever Alexia Ashford was doing are pretty much the only out and out success stories anyone has had through all of this. Everything else was just stuff getting out of hand. If you want to call Resident Evil a horror franchise, then be afraid of these folks. Of the fact that there are delusional people like this in the world who would mess with the very fabric of nature for personal profit and glory. What they will plunge the world into just because someone paid them to do so, or simply because they can. This is what has rescued this series from losing favor with me as it has expanded with reckless abandon over the years. Taken as a whole, the larger, more abstract implications of what the situations and the world mean are kind of an interesting hypothetical to me. What happens when a bunch of morally bankrupt corporations and billionaires exist in a world teeming with catastrophic world-ending potential? I can't say I ever thought that's where I would end up with this series, as I played RE Remake on the GameCube all those years ago. What appealed to me at the time was how Resident Evil was apparently a new paradigm for the point-and-click adventure puzzle games that I had grown up loving. That's right, my channel will never escape footage of the Myst series. Figuring out the purpose of devices and mechanisms in this strange new place, and the series of bizarre keys and activators we find strewn about the mansion really spoke to me, and putting it in a new kind of setting was just the kind of novelty I needed to keep me hooked for life. As the series has gone onwards, the puzzle aspect has faded, the action has started to clarify, and the scary stuff got more and more off the wall. So much of the series has pulled away from those puzzle adventure roots, and what makes me sad is that they only thought to replace it with more of what was already there. The space that was once occupied by strange puzzles or contemplative application of information and finding new things to throw at the established formula faded away in the mid-series, turning it into new ways and reasons to shoot some zombies. There has always been room in this series to explore established characters or situations in this world both large and small, and this potential was clearly recognized and almost capitalized on. Resident Evil 6, a game that seemed perfectly designed for providing new modes of play or different situations with its four chapter character setup, sadly could only think to use its different settings as different settings in which to shoot zombies, or whatever the heck these are supposed to be. Yeah, it's a bad game. For my money, the series over the years has failed to fully take hold of what's possible, and has allowed scope to become bloat. But as most of you are probably aware, it's at this point that Capcom took their cue, started to whittle down and focus this flagship series of theirs. It's kind of the opposite of what I had quietly always hoped for, but there's no denying that, like I said before, it's a totally fantastic turnaround. 
With the advent of Resident Evil 7, it seemed clear that this series was, to go with an overused phrase, going back to its roots. Up close and personal visceral horror, a new situation recapturing the sense of unknowing, the mechanical fear brought on by limited resources and just general pervasive anxiety. But when the game attempted to address the scale the series had become known for, it all kind of went sideways. The primary character conflict was even over as of the approach to the final stretch and it fell right back into being a new setting to kill proverbial zombies in. As it stood though, RE7 was enough for me. My favorite franchise was back, and it may look and feel different, but it meant business, and wound up being one of my favorite games of its year, and one that I look back on fondly. Clearly, an eighth game, ninth if you count them properly, was on the way, and in this regard, I was not disappointed. It looked big and bold and weird, and a little worrisome. We've seen what happens when Resident Evil indulges its legacy above all else. We know what happens when it gets weird and tries to go big like this, but thankfully my worries were unfounded, and yes, now, after that long rambly mini retrospective I just did, it is finally time to talk about Resident Evil 8. Which means... spoilers. Like, all of them. Okay? Okay. In the context of this series that I love, Resident Evil 8 really was a most unexpected venture. The line I have used over the months since getting it started is, it's the crossover between RE4 and RE7 I never knew I wanted. 4 is one of my all-time favorite games, and it is basically a Resident Evil game in name only. It is the first of the series to heavily focus on action. It does away with the fixed camera perspectives the series had been known for. It barely tries to maintain any kind of tone, and it's got all kinds of stuff going on and is totally another game in the series I could talk about forever. And yet 8 is almost a masterwork in balancing the frantic sprawling feel of 4 with the quiet lingering dread of 7. The initial approach to the village feels like a direct homage to the village assault sequence in RE4. It brings back the treasure hunting, the block-based inventory, and I never thought you could get a shopkeeper that would even be half as memorable as RE4's monocreless merchant clad in blue. On the other side of it, the game recalls 7 with a dire scarcity of resources, a strong focus on actual puzzles, a cast of characters acting collectively as antagonists, introduced together then fought one by one over the the course of the game, and the whole being chased by a big imposing figure thing happens again, because I, I, I guess this is just a staple of the series now. But aside from these similarities, recognizing where the series has come from, Village puts real work into standing apart and indulging its own goals. You can only go so far with the world constantly ending, so maybe we need to look at a personal apocalypse for a while. Ethan, our protagonist, gets a much stronger, much more consistent motivation. We may have stumbled upon yet another localized catastrophe, but like RE7 before it, our protagonist is pulled into the conflict through actual motivations. His infant daughter has been kidnapped. It's not just professional obligation or wrong place, wrong time anymore. There are real personal stakes here. Where this series used to rely on existential horror, something that you had to meet the game halfway on, this time we actually see the human element. It's not just looking at a horde of what used to be people suddenly becoming super interested in taking a bite out of you, we get to see the direct effect upon innocent people as things are falling apart. Never before has a game in the series given us this clear a glimpse of the localized horror affecting people beyond its central characters. The idea was always there, but it was almost always relegated to singular interactions or obscured into the secondhand spaces of the notes and journals the series loves so much. While previous games in the series have done everything they can to forget about the point and click influences on the series at large, this game embraces and adapts them, actually going so far as creating one of the more memorable game space puzzles I've encountered recently. And like, I, I've seen a good number of puzzles lately. <laughs> and what do you know? A Resident Evil game is indulging the interpretive abstract for once. 
though in my opinion Seven kind of did this too. I saw it as a metaphor for meeting your significant other's weird family for the first time, their freaky protective parents and the weird brother who's still single and is into some weird hobby, so basically me, and seeing for the first time what unexpected tendencies and behavior being around their family brings out in someone who's important to you. With RE8, it's even easier to see how it's at least interested in exploring the worries of parenthood, anxieties about sex, pregnancy, and early parenthood, depression, and resentment of responsibilities. Like, someone high up on this development team pretty obviously was a new parent when they were working on this. Which explains perfectly, I think, the biggest choice, italicized and bolded, Resident Evil Village makes with its villain. For the first time in the series, the protagonist and the villain want the same thing. And they did this while changing virtually nothing to the formula that has existed since the beginning of the series. Mother Miranda, for much of the game, looks and behaves not unlike what we've seen before. She is in a position of power. She is, or more accurately has, dabbled in strange forces we don't understand yet. And she has unleashed a horrifying disaster on a local populace that looks like it has the potential to spread. So far, so familiar, right? The major difference in her presentation is that the game doesn't offer up information on her easily. People talk about her in hushed tones, but nothing specific is ever given. Much of her iconography and associations in the game have to do with ideas and themes of worship. And she seems to want Rose because Rose has some kind of power that she wants. We are meant to be in awe of her, even as we oppose her. And this leads to one of the biggest shocks the series has ever given me. It's not a huge plot twist reveal, not an unexpected development in the moment. It's just the quiet realization that Mother Miranda isn't interested in conquering or destroying anything in the name of profit or glory. In the right light, in a much more relatable way than those who came before her, a Resident Evil villain is suddenly almost sympathetic. Towards the end of the game, we learn that this great evil force personified we have fought against this whole time is just a grieving parent who believes that through this power that she has attained, she has found a way to bring her daughter back to life, using Rose to do so. She may have driven away those closest to her. She may have dragged those loyal to her into a bizarre servitude they probably didn't ask for. She may have mutated and mutilated a village full of people as a rehearsal for the main event, bringing to light the darkest possible interpretation of the saying, it takes a village to raise a child, a reference I have to think was intentional, but at the root of it all, she, like Ethan, is a parent who is just trying to do right by her child. Ethan is willing to do whatever is necessary to get Rose back, and Miranda is similarly willing to burn down everything around her for Eva. The only meaningful difference between them, albeit a considerable one, is the power that Miranda wields. A power that she has worked and developed over years before we got here, that rivals and more or less resembles what we have seen before. She, like Oswell Spencer, Albert Wesker, William Birkin, Alexia Ashford, Sadler, and Simmons before her, have stumbled into something unexplainable that can be a means to an end. And if you are driven by grief and presented a solution, wouldn't you try anything you could to fix it? And don't misinterpret me, I'm not rooting for Miranda here. Ethan is fully in the right for doing what he does to save Rose, but I have to think that with enough space between them, even if they could never agree with the other, Ethan and Miranda could have understood each other, knowing full well what the other is going through and what has brought them to their current situation. This is the conceptual angle on which this game reaches me, that puts all of the other games into a stronger context. It's a series that has always been about the apocalypse, but one that is always coming to you. A series of characters who might as well just stand there stone-faced, staring down the crumbling of humanity that kinda just showed up one day. If they're lucky, they get to find out why it's happening, but that's kind of it. 
Resident Evil Village instead ponders on what happens when we are drawn to it, almost inviting the apocalypse into our lives through attachments, affections, the things that lead you to struggles and changes within yourself. An apocalypse doesn't have to mean the end of the world with fires and chaos and all that. It can just be personal. It can just be change or loss, something that feels insurmountable that has appeared in your life. This is a game that has you battling against Rust Punk Van Helsing with Magneto powers, a six-winged angel of death, Jigsaw meets Annabelle, a 19 or so foot tall vampire lady, and just a really big stinkfish thing. But still, these can be taken at face value, and I did. I do, in some respect. But they can also be read as ambitious manifestations of the kinds of feelings that will hit you when life is upended so severely. The kind of thing that's always waiting around the corner to interrupt your thoughts and send you reeling, tormenting you like it knows you're afraid, darkening the sky above you, always waiting and watching. And who among us has never felt at times like they wanted to destroy something in anger, out of grief, bring catastrophic change to make something right, or just watch it burn? Mother Miranda may just be another Resident Evil villain in practice, an imposing figurehead who goes all full-on monster mutant on us for the final battle, but maybe she's really not so different from anyone who would do anything, and I mean anything, to save the people they love. Not that different from Ethan, who gives everything, even beyond what he ever thought he could. To me, Resident Evil Village is a sign that the series has moved past the for-your-consideration nature of the situations it has offered over the years. The game opening with a storybook being read to a child is no accident. Resident Evil is going to tell stories now. There you go, sweetheart. Don't you worry. I'll be right downstairs. Something that I've always believed about the Resident Evil franchise was that it had, or I guess has, a lot more potential than it seems to think it does. There's a lot of room in the world of this series to explore other angles. Political, scientific, philosophical. But in the end, I think Resident Evil's greatest struggle is that it couldn't figure out how to explore the space it finds itself in without needing to constantly attach itself to its history as one of the great scary games of the past. A game that was known on the surface by all observers as the game with zombies in it. But ultimately, it's that scope I mentioned before that resonates with me. The idea that natural forces of the world which humanity can only hope to fully understand are out there, ready to change everything we know without reasoning or purpose beyond simply that it could happen, therefore it might, is powerful to me. See the Outer Wilds video for more on that. The figureheads in front of it are kind of just a symptom of language. They are how we understand these things something we can beat the crap out of when the game is about to end. That kind of familiarity is how we can latch on to what is happening in front of us, even if the game itself is just a document of the happy endings we somehow manage to eke out in spite of everything. And I would say that perspective in my mind was always there, but it was solidified here in Resident Evil 8. Chris's final run through the village to destroy the Megamycete is some of the best high-action recognition of scope the series has ever seen. Better than anything he or anyone else got in 6, that's for sure. But watching Chris, the old, possibly oldest pro the series has at this point in the story, working his way through the meat grinder that is this clustered disaster, and finding at its epicenter something overwhelming, even in the face of what we have seen thus far, set that idea into place. The Megamycete Seat is simply a presence, with no goals other than to propagate and survive. This is made clear when we learn of Ethan's somewhat contentious plot twist about his true nature, that he, like Miranda, is empowered by the mold, a revelation that does nothing to lessen the conflict between them, while the Megamycete simply observes, seemingly indifferent to the outcome. 
its existence is secondary to the story that has led us to this point. Ethan and Miranda are really only here because of what the mold can do, not because the thing itself necessarily needs to be defeated. Resident Evil Village pulled good and far away from what I had initially wanted for this franchise that I love, and thankfully it did so in a way that I appreciate greatly. It is absolutely dedicated to its pedigree, not just because Chris Redfield is here, but because it acknowledges the unspoken work the series has been doing this whole time, exploring more of this strange and dangerous alternate Earth, and establishing the existentially terrifying themes I've always felt, even if I haven't always recognized them, throughout the series. What's more, is it does all of this while offering a sympathetic story from both sides of the conflict. There is a situation unfolding, and a story being told. Because Resident Evil is going to tell stories now. And I couldn't be more excited for that if I tried. <laughs>